Hello, Texas, and welcome to the Hello, Texas podcast with Tim Murphy and Steve Peters. This week, Steve and Tim talk with Central Texas musician Wes Perryman. They talk about his life and career as a farmer and his growth as a singer-songwriter, as a solo artist, and with the band Lily and the Implements. We hope you enjoy the conversation. actually do it so you we'll ready? start hello texas <laughs> hey how wow no we, we, no, we, we already clapped that part <laughs> in so. okay. that was a little underwhelming yeah, yeah. Right, let's do look, it look it, this is the chillest podcast we've had yet we're it is. about as comfortable as we could possibly be at the moment <laughs> uh and, and and we love the backyard and and that's been kind of the place where we we've kind of worked out some details but today we are sitting in perryman farms at, at West Perryman's house. Thank you for having us. Glad you're here. Beautiful been, house, and and I love. We've been in here setting up for the past hour or two, and I love everything about it. Oh, thanks, everything. Man. You thanks. offered me a cup of coffee, and not only did you put cream in it, you got the spoon out and you mixed it all. It went to the details. Well, yeah, so, man. I'm a coffee snob so, like you. Yeah, so. we're coffee snobs. So, yeah. um, you are. Well, you're snob on more than just. I just coffee. like the expensive coffee because it doesn't have the acid or whatever in it, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just, I'm purposely just sitting here, just letting you just kind of, sorry. I, I know. Well, we're here talking to Wes who, uh, has been a friend for a long time, uh, musician, farmer, uh, family man, uh, so much. You, you just, you, you're kind of the epitome of, of people don't realize I met you through Lily and the implements, right? I think that was, I may have known who you was before that, but I think that's where I really found out, holy crap, this guy's got chops. <laughs> Thanks, and man. and then, you know, come along with Napier and all these other people, and I realized you've got ties to music that that's maybe not quite as mainstream for what we deal with, but everybody knows who you are. Well, and all of that is really the, the whole episode we're about to film. Uh it's a blessing and a curse, though, <laughs> to talking about that because I am I'm drawn to uh, I'm not really drawn to mainstream. I'm drawn like most everything I listen to. You know, it's even when I first started playing acoustically. Um, well, we was listening like, to yeah. Jerry Jeff Walker a while ago, just kind of playing, and it was it was like some jazzy kind of jazzy Jeff. <laughs> it, yeah. If I had to create a poster for what Texas music is, not Texas country, but Texas music is, and I've probably told you this before it's it's your photo on the poster of you're a literal farmer writing songs on the tractor out <laughs> in the fields and coming back and and picking the guitar and sitting in this room that we're sitting in right now but wait and, what does that mean because if, if you don't know who you are you don't know what that what do you mean not riding on the tractor you mean all right so my tractor sexy kind of mm-hmm. riding on the tractor like that oh he's just a good old boy riding through the farm with his got, shirt off he's got and, le- you got legit stuff out there you got ac yeah. on the yeah this is this isn't some little ford tractor that your grandpa's mowing the All back right. 40 with let's start at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> yeah where are you from oh i'm from moody texas from yeah. moody texas yeah moody texas that's where we're sitting right now yeah um is just uh it's between waco and temple uh-huh. or belton uh Middle of nowhere, basically, is where this is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, born and raised here. Um, yeah, never lived anywhere else. Yeah, so, um, yeah, born and raised in Moody. Grew up third generation farmer. So, my uh, both sides of my parents they were farmers, and um, so I didn't really have. I did have a choice, but after I graduated high school. <clears throat> You know, I grew up as a kid riding on a tractor with my dad. I start falling asleep, and then, you know, hit a bump, and my head would hit the glass <laughs> on the tractor cab. You know, and yeah. So I mean, I you know, as long as I can remember, I've been on the mm-hmm. farm. You know, mm-hmm. so that's been a huge part of me. And then in high school, I got really into uh, music and doing other things. And when I graduated, I went you to MCC. Sport- I went sports? to MCC for like a month. Mm. You played sports. I did. I played football in junior high, and then I became a Skater punk and moody, which is not an easy feat. Uh, <laughs> well, I seen the, the, skate, the skateboards yeah, back here yeah, behind me. Yeah, yeah. I actually chipped a vertebra on my neck when I was like sixteen. 
<laughs> so, so you said third generation farmer. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so that's the other side of this that we want to get to. We want to make sure it's yeah. understood. Not only are you this accomplished musician, just total badass. Oh, thanks, man. But you're like the real deal farmer. I mean, there's you pull up. There's a couple of million dollars worth of farming <laughs> equipment out here, and and like the real deal. And I mean, we've had to postpone. Uh, we we postponed this, I think, because you was in the field because of rain. <laughs> Yeah. And and yeah. I, and I think was that hit me. On the way here, he's like, uh, when are y'all showing up? I got work to do. And I'm like. <laughs> I, mean, I was doing it, the work. Right, I just wanted, it yeah, hit yeah. me. That that's, you know, this is, you're the real deal. That's the whole other side of, of who you are. Yeah. How many acres do y'all have? Between my father and myself, we farm about 3,500 acres. Wow. And that's uh, small in Texas. Yeah. I mean, it's, we're. We're pretty like medium size for okay. around this area, so we have some neighbors that farm around six thousand acres. But um, there's definitely people that farm less. But so what, when you what, was what do you younger, farm? The difference though, we literally it's my dad and I. Like every once in a while, my dad's cousin will help us a little bit, drive a tractor. But oh yeah, we pretty much do all the work, all the labor. So we don't have employees or anything. What do y'all farm? Corn, cotton, and wheat. And some uh, grain sorghum or milo, whatever you want to call it. I wanted to talk about the grain because I know that you're doing something special with that. Um, Is that still going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm growing some heirloom wheat for a distillery in Austin. That started started making making whiskey out of it. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that one time. That is cool. Did did they give you the whiskey for free? And they Uh, they've they've given me a few (laughs) bottles. Yeah, is it good? uh, It's pretty good. Now I will say, and it's pretty cool being on the podcast, but. I spent a lot of time in the tractor and I was listening to Joe Rogan Yeah, and I noticed, uh, there's a couple of, now that he's moved to Austin, Mm -hmm. when people, when they drink whiskey, there's a bottle of their, uh, still Austin is the distillery that I grow wheat for. And, and, uh, so they, they've been drinking their whiskey on Joe Rogan's podcast. So I thought that was pretty cool. So you may have a hookup with Joe Rogan at some point. Who knows? And maybe we could go on his show and he could cuss us and stuff and I'd be all right Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'd be good with Joe. That's cool. But yeah, no, it cracked me up. I was like, holy crap, that's, that's like, that's, that's the the distillery I grow for. I thought that was pretty rad. Now, so musician, skate punk, farmer, third generation. How old was you when you started getting into music or you noticed that music was something you was attracted to? Yeah. So as far back as I can remember, I've always been drawn to it. Um, I grew up in the church. My my uh, my dad and my aunts and uncles they all had a, a, a quartet. Like I grew up in the Methodist church. Okay. And like old school country, like uh, Heavenly Highways hymns and stuff yeah. like that. You know. And so I can remember going around to different churches on Sunday mornings to mm. where the quartet would would sing, you mm. know, specials at churches and stuff. Um, that was all acapella stuff, you know. My my aunt would go play the chord on the piano and then walk up. Mm. And they would all sing, you know. It was, yeah. They're really good. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of my introduction. But my dad, um, he, he, I think he just played in high school jazz band and stuff and marching band. But he played saxophone. But really, my dad is the one that got me. So he was into, okay with the musical direction. Not really, but he's it's his fault. <laughs> but see, that's what I was I was curious about. You said yeah. third generation farmer. Yeah. How does that look? Yeah. It's funny you say that because. Your family's huge supporters of what you do now. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, I see them at shows all the time. But yeah, but what I, what I was getting at is, is when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, we are going on a road trip, and my dad, we go to the music store, and he gets these cassette tapes. Yeah. And he gets, like, uh, like not what you would ever expect a, a farmer to buy, but he it's like Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, which is, like, crazy modern jazz. Like, Bela Fleck plays, he's a banjo virtuoso, and then wow. uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy on the band called Future Man that played... Um, it was like reggae, you know. Uh, yeah. He played like an electric drum kit, but it was like something he built himself. And then uh, Vic, Victor Wooten, who's a bass player, virtuoso, like slap bass, just look him up. Victor Wooten. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. So anyway, so my, this, my dad turns me on to this when I'm a kid, you know. And uh, and then there's another tape. It was like acoustic alchemy, which is like a, a classical guitar, jazz kind of oh, stuff. Like kind of so, yeah. almost. When I listen back now, it's like really special to me still, but it almost sounds like elevator music to, if you didn't know anything about it. But it's really, really good chops, really good playing. And uh, so my dad is a huge part of why I got into like... Was there ever a point where there may have been some question about where you was going to maybe take over the family business or maybe take a musical direction? You know, you know my, my parents never pushed that. They really didn't... Uh, 
that's where I, when I was in high school, like I said, you know, skater punk and just yeah. rebellious. I didn't play football in high school until my senior year, which being in a small town, two way school. Say, Moody, you just play. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But um, I actually, that's what the coach told my dad at the end of the year. He's like, he would have been a hell of a football player if he knew what he was doing out there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, I was pretty rebellious and, and not a great student. And yeah. just, I, you know. I, but you was doing, you was still living the farm life and everything. Still yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I definitely, you know. Being every, a rebellious every, kid. Was you yeah. rebellious to your parents? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So tough, tough for them. You growing yeah. Up. I mean, I wasn't like. It wasn't anything terrible, but yeah. I was worse to them than I was. Teenage James. You were looking yeah. to get off the farm. Yeah. You were looking yeah. to get away. For I just a while. always have felt out of place in, in the small town environment. Like, you know, it's just one of those I, I always felt like I needed to be somewhere where, like, there was nobody around me that, that looked at art the way I did, that looked at music or creativity the way that, like, yeah. small town, it was either you play football or you were a loser. So I was basically just like, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to ride a skateboard and listen to punk rock but that it's like some of the friends i had back then is that was the first time i got into playing guitar um my parents tell a story when i was a kid i had a little toy guitar and i got in trouble and they took it away from me and i found this like junky guitar in the closet and like put a couple of strings on it i was sitting there like i didn't have my regular guitar but i still matter. found a way to play you know it, I didn't know what I was doing back then, but it was just, I was always drawn to it. Yeah. Uh, another segue story to that, probably when I was like 10 or 12, we were in Lubbock at a farm show with my grandparents, my parents, and they had like the Dodge tent, you know, uh, and there was a band playing in there. And so I was hanging out and they all kind of, so I kind of disappeared. Like they left me there playing with the band. They all wandered off and my parents my dad came back trying to find me he couldn't find me well the band had taken a break and they're in there like rv and they're like hey <laughs> so i started talking to him i was up in the rv with the band and so they're walking around the farm show like where the hell's wes you know and uh come to find out my dad was telling me this just like a few months ago that band was cooter gras really so wow i had you know like i just remember like it was just like but yeah so <laughs> i thought that was pretty a pretty fitting story funny. for this but so I've always been, you know, uh, allured by the stage, by making music, by being, you know. Yeah. But for me, like, I like doing, I've done the singer-songwriter stuff way more than than I have the band thing. Like, right. Uh, but anyway, so I've always just wanted to be on stage making music. It didn't, How old are you? Didn't, you I'm mind? 37. 37. Yeah. Wow. And when when did you officially come into farm life? Um, for yourself, I officially got skin in the game in 2008. Wow. So, so a few years. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while, but, uh, that was, I got married in 2007 and I went from just being a farmhand. Now I don't know the format y'all want to do this in, so I, I don't want to jump around too much, but if You're we're going to okay. keep, if we're going to keep going on the history of like yeah. how I got to here, uh, I graduated high school and I went to MCC for music production. And another funny thing about me, I have a very deep understanding of music. I can pick up a guitar and play along with just about anything, you know, but I never learned how to read music. I was how, like, how did you learn to play just by ear? Yeah. I was like first and second chair trombonist in, in, in school and I never learned how to read music. I had a band director that was very aware of my abilities. And so he would kind of take time and play. To the, he, he was really good to me. I drove him crazy too. It's funny, but he was really good to me. And so I learned the parts and then we, we would do tryouts and I would nail them, you know? And that's uh, so funny. So, but so for even now, like I wish I could read music because I, I feel like it's a handicap, but it just doesn't mm. make sense in my brain the way I, when I hear music and feel it, it's, it, different it's than not how something you like that you, it. you can write out. Right. Like it's, it's way more intricate than that to me. It's not visual. It's but, what uh, is it? So, oh. so I graduate, I go to MCC. For music production and um how long did that last about a month about a month <laughs> <laughs> but i was having to take like a remedial english class if i could have just taken the classes i wanted I, I may have stuck around a little longer yeah yeah but i was like this is too much like high school you know but um hey god you was ready to i get was out of there. i was taking um i had music production class which i loved and then there was a sight reading class which I don't know how to read music and I'm supposed to like sight read it. And then like there's a guy playing music on the piano and I'm supposed to write out what it is. And oh. uh, so I was like, this ain't working. And then I also <laughs> had a music theory class that I was taking. Like I was all over my head, you know, 
So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to the farm. <laughs> so I go back and work on the farm. And uh, a couple of years go by, and I turn 21. And then um, there's this, this um, trailer house about a half mile down the road from, from my parents' house. And you was working on your parents' farm. Yeah, then. I was working okay. with my dad. So I get this call from my uncle, and he's like, uh, a lady lives across the street from me is looking for somebody to shred her, her, her property. So, okay, yeah, I'll do that. So I go up and pull in and, and meet these people. And it, and it turns out to be Amanda Brown. And uh, Amanda Brown is an a amazing, great singer, great artist. Um, so I she, meet her. I, I and, just found out she used to be with, was it Johnny D and the Rocket 88s? No, or, no it was, it was um, a, um, we'll get back to, we'll yeah. circle back on that one. I, but it was around the same lines. That, yeah, uh, she, she, she went to South Plains Music. And got a, a, a music. You know, uh, we've talked South Plains a lot. Yeah. We have. Yeah. So so I know I know the name. Oh, she's she's a phenomenal. She sang on a jillion records. Like she sang on like some of Stoney stuff, some Mike McClure stuff. I'm not even doing her justice on her discography. Of, I like, think that's where I, I think I know it from right. the Mike McClure yeah. story. Kind of yeah. some of that. But anyway, so phenomenal singer. She was dating this guy named Jeremy Watkins, and that's what. So when I pulled in with the shredder. There's this Jason Bull and the Stragglers uh, trailer and van sitting in the in front of this trailer house. And I'm like, what is this, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I, I mow her yard. I meet Amanda. And she's like, ah, just like so much fun. And I'm like, okay, I've met my new favorite place to go, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, 21. Uh, and Amanda's yeah. still that way today. So, so. shortly after that, um, I meet another guy that was hanging out that just happened to be at Amanda's house. And his name's Jeremy Yeager, and he was playing drums in this band called Hogleg Ellis, which was a Waco area band. And so he's like, oh, we're playing at Georgia's tonight. You should come out. So I go out to Georgia's, and I meet Russian Steel, who's the lead singer of Hogleg Ellis. And he's from Lot, Texas, phenomenal songwriter. So I got to know all of them, and next thing I know, every weekend I'm going on the road with them in the van and running sound, just being a roadie, just basically. Just hanging out? Yeah, with just them. hanging out. Listening to him play, Sammy Colunga is still one of my favorite guitar players. He's just phenomenal. All right, so, so Sammy plays. Last I heard, Sammy was playing with Lost Roaches. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I know he does a lot of other stuff. Him and um, oh, uh, with the Shack, Isaac. Isaac, yeah, man. Oh, Isaac, yeah. 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 So this this is kind of my introduction to the whole to Waco, those guys to the whole Waco scene was through. Uh, and those guys yeah. were fairly fresh, kind of out of school, and and I'm guessing if I'm they're all tied to other people who are going to NCC, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, going to school. So you're kind of in that same age yeah. range within yeah. five or a few years of everybody. Exactly. Oh wow. Yeah, exactly. Because that whole scene now. So I met I met John Dempsey in this time, oh, and Nick wow. Dennard or Denard, however you say his name. Dinner. 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 Sorry, Nick. Yeah, dinner. <laughs> it's it's been Nick. a while. Yeah, it's all right, Nick. Nick. Yeah, and then uh, Kimberly Kelly and Kristen Kelly. I met all them at, at this time. You know, Kimberly was uh, Nick and JD. Because that was the, they were all the they were Todd, all playing Todd Lanningham, yeah. Jeremy Bryant. All of those guys were kind of coming out of that same. But this is this cut. is Waco roots right here. Holy right? cow! Yeah. Name so many names that. Yeah, I've been around for. This is around like 2004. Yeah, and, 20 years. and yeah. these guys are, are either playing studio stuff now, or they're with Wade Bowen, or they're they're accomplished in their own right somehow. Mm -hmm. But you know who they are if you know the music. That's, yeah, that's crazy. So that's, some really fun. Th I ended up not with within a few months. I ended up moving in to Amanda Brown's trailer house. This is like. A, when I met Amanda, she was with Jeremy. Like, they broke up, and he was gone. But, yeah, so it, Jeremy Watkins is a whole other thing. Like, I went out and saw them play for my birthday. At, we know uh, who Jeremy Watkins is. Yeah, was. Jeremy's phenomenal. Great guy, man. He's a good time. Yeah. I hadn't seen him in years, but I still would, like, be happy. You know, like, I yeah. feel like we pick up where we left off, you know. But I went out and saw them play at, um, what is the... What is the the ice house out there by the lake by the airport? What is it called? Uh, Lakeside. Lakeside. Lakeside Tavern. Yeah. We went out and saw they were uh, Jason Bowen was playing in the backyard there, and so I go out there for my birthday and they're playing when I show up and Jeremy Watkins is like from stage, hey Wes like give me a big shout out, <laughs> and then like when I, like just like perfect gentleman on I was just like wow you know made me feel so special you know really cool like I to this day I like I try to emulate some of that you know it was just really class act of him to, yeah, to, yeah anyway so so he kind of left a mark on me too just for a little bit of time i do that to steve yeah. whenever you know i'm right I'm, I, I try to throw yeah. steve some love you know did that front wednesday at the photo shoot yeah, i did yeah I, I want everybody yeah. to know yeah i get that yeah so Sorry. so circle back i end up moving into amanda brown's and uh quit the farm 
and move a half a mile down the road from my parents' house <laughs> into this trailer house. So and wait a minute. So it, so you was working twenty yeah, yeah. twenties, early twenties. Yeah. You go from teenage angst, working on dad's farm, I'm not gonna go to school I can't to being imagine. a roadie. To hang, hanging out with, like, with bowling people. Yeah. I, 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 I know where this is going. I yeah. can't imagine the party that oh. you and Amanda. Well, you know what? Let's place. take a break uh, and come can, back. Let's take yeah. a break. Okay. And let's come back and let's, let's yeah. get to that. We'll, we'll dig yeah. into that. Yeah. 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 We'll be right back. <laughs> there we go. This is Steve. I'm with the West Perryman and John Napier. Hello, Hello Texas. Texas. And we're back. Hey, <laughs> hello, hello Texas. Texas. It's Tim and Steve and I. We're sitting here talking to Wes Perryman in his living room at, at the at farm. Perryman Farm. I this, can't this say is, thank you enough for having us. This is yeah, this is fun. Hand built by you, this house. Yeah. This is designed and built by Wes himself. And it's awesome. Everything. I've, I see videos of y'all uh, recording in here. Yeah. Uh, practicing in here. But everything about this thing is just... It's a special place. It, it really worked out. Um, my uncle was a house builder. And when, when, uh, when my wife and I were designing it, some of the things we wanted to do, he was like, what? No. <laughs> and then at one point he said, what, do you want your house to look like a Mexican food restaurant? I was like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? Yeah, right. <laughs> I love Mexican food. So I, I can Mexican see that a little bit. Yeah. Right? I don't, yeah. I don't quite get it. I, I could no, I it. can't remember what he I, like. There was, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, and then he's like, "Yeah, you could get a giant hippopotamus and put it on the front of your house, but why?" But that's kind of why we got the chicken in our front yard. <laughs> well, I don't know if you, you saw see, the chicken. So, yeah, so there's a giant chicken. I'm going to yeah. guess that building this house comes some years after the party we was just talking about that yes. he was right. about yeah. to yeah. take off. So yeah. where we are in the story. We ended the first, yeah. we ended it before the break, we was talking about you moving in to Amanda Brown's trailer house a few months after. Yeah, yeah. After, and yeah. it, take us off Vince, from there. Vince what Vance. was Okay, so Vince, yeah, Vince, Vince Vance, Vance and the Valley, that's that, who Amanda that's right. sang with, was Vince Vance, that's right. Vince Vance, I know okay. I've heard that He's got too. the big old monster mohawk. Thing so when I met my so when I met my my old friend Jeremy Yeager, um, he was coming fresh off a of divorce. Mm. In fact, one night we were playing at Graham Central Station in Waco. With I wasn't playing. Hogleg Ellis was playing, and I was just there as a roadie. Like Hogleg Ellis is that the same Hogleg? That's okay. who Sammy played with. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Wow. So anyway, so we were there, and then this guy walks up. Jeremy Yeager's like, yeah. And he served him papers at Graham Central Station. He got divorced papers. Oh, man. <laughs> I witnessed that. It was wild. Oh. It was really interesting. But anyway, so <laughs> so, so me and him and Amanda Brown, moving, we, we move into Amanda's trailer house. Like, we all have our own bedrooms and everything. But it's all about the music there. Like, from the time, from wake to, it was, that, that was the whole thing, man. Um, it, was just, it was just riding, playing, well, practicing. Just playing, jamming, listening to music. Is, you know, obviously a, lots of drinking. Amanda's a singer, um mm -hmm. and this was before she yeah I mean, she's got to be about your age right and she's a few years older than me i'm okay. not exactly sure how many probably about three or four years older than me but y'all are the, the same uh places in your career yeah she was uh, like a mother hand to me when she took yeah. me in like she was like you're good but you need you need to learn how to be an adult, you know? Like, yeah, like she like, I remember she'd like leave post-it notes on the washing machine, like how to do things. And, you know, but don't it, we all need that? I, yeah, I think, no, it was I great. Think, like, especially yeah, guys. I, I, I say it lovingly. I mean, it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was funny because there's so much debauchery, but there was also so much like, this is how to be there's some discipline. This is how to be a grown up. You yeah, know, there was a way yeah. that there was a way to behave and mm -hmm. a way to act and a way to care. But you never, cool. you never knew from 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 day to day who was going to show up there. So I mentioned like Nick and JD and, and those guys, but then like Rodney Pyatt was uh, Amanda's stepdad, phenomenal guitar player. So he'd show up in the afternoons, and we'd uh, we'd ride around. And listen, I remember one day we listened to a cassette tape of Nina Simone that I found in in a, in a drawer in Amanda's house, and just having a good time. And then I just learned, just absorbed so much about musicianship, more than just how to play, but like. Things like really, really basic rules that every musician should know, like especially singer songwriters, like yeah. don't start a song if you don't, if you're not planning on finishing it. You know, you got to commit to it. Yeah. And yeah. if if you if you mess up, like just keep going. Run especially in it. a live scenario, because like, don't just stop. 
If, if you're playing, you, get, such, you keep playing. Just one such, song you know, of many you're going to play. Yeah. Not that night, yeah. but even through a lifetime. That's such great advice because I've seen mm. so many you know, new people get up on stage and start to play and go, ah, I quit. I don't know that song. Yeah, like, no. Don't start it if you ain't going to finish it. That's right. That was a big one. That I remember because I've, I've actually I've, I've heard I've heard you know you you bit smaller singer songwriter kind of things and yeah. guys go okay well you know what is is there anything that you would like to hear and I know that's a double edged sword that's a scary question to ask yeah, <laughs> it is and, and and normally you get this from a little bit more experienced musicians who who could kind of play some stuff and and um and, and they go you know and every now and then they'll get a request and mm-hmm. no I don't know it and they don't even try they don't even go. Well, well, it starts off like this. Well, I appreciate that, but I just, mm-hmm. I did not know that. Just kind of a, yeah. Don't so, play it if you don't. Yeah. Don't. So, so, so that's where you became. There was the legendary, yeah, there. legendary jam sessions that happened there every night. I mean, we would go out on Sunday sometimes to, um, to, um, Holland, Texas, to the Cotton Club. Mm-hmm. And they would have oh, they would have like an open and not, and not open. You you got to know the right people, but it was like a jam. So you could get up and do a song with the band. Now back twenty years ago, yeah. Cotton Club was a pretty big deal. Yeah, I don't th- yeah. I don't know that it is. So we we came back from the Cotton Club. Uh, all these musicians, just I can't remember all who was there, but uh, there was some guys, two or three guys from Australia, really great pickers. And so we were having a great time playing back at, at Amanda's and. And uh, I remember them being like, man, y'all are great. Anytime y'all want to come to Australia, you know, you got a place to stay, come hang out. And I remember being like, I am going to Australia. You know, like, <laughs> I'm going to save up everything I got. I'm going to go hang out with these guys. Because to the best of my understanding, they play with like the George Strait equivalent of, you know, in Australia. So oh, wow. anyway, so I mean, these, this, I just remember being like telling everybody, like, I'm saving up every penny I got and I'm going to Australia. <laughs> Which I still would love to go. I've I've always yeah. been fascinated. You're 21. Yeah, and I've always been fascinated with Australia. Sure. You know? But anyway, so I, obviously I didn't go to Australia. I didn't make it. But um, I learned seriously so much. I I, I had a, a a pickup. I sold it. I got like ten thousand cash out of it, and I bought this four thousand dollar recording console, <laughs> and um. Just, just wow. get, just dive head first into recording and songwriting, and really, that's where I started writing. I may have written a song or two before that, um, but that's really where that's and where the ball. Figuring out the navigation of yeah. how to, yeah, wow. So, so that's what what, yeah. what did you write? How did you write? Uh, so I wrote Ten Feet Tall there. Okay, um, Ten Feet Tall is how I was introduced to, to Wes. First time I walked into O'Brien's, heard you playing that, was like, what's going on? So, I was listening to a lot of. I remember this too because Amanda Brown had got. This was back when you like go to Hastings still and get CDs and DVDs. And I loved, I loved me some Hastings back yeah, in the day. Me you too. know, I miss Hastings. Waco had a Hastings and it was, yeah, it, it was, was where it was at, really man. Yeah, I love that place, man. Anyway, so one day she came home with the Free Will and Bob Dylan uh, CD, and uh, you're I connect, was you're connecting so many yeah, dots yeah. from what I know about you. Right so now. my 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 only real knowledge of, I mean, I knew folk music. But more in the sense of like my grandparents love things like um, Homer and Jethro and like uh, my, my grandpa loved Western Swing. And like I grew up listening to like Ernest Tubb and like real old country and stuff. But, you know, my only real knowledge at that time of folk music, that what I thought of was uh, what was that that uh, mockumentary? Um, uh, the, what, what, a Mighty the Wind. wind. The Mighty Wind. Yeah, yeah. So so I'd seen that and I was like, you know, I'm not really into folk music. <laughs> That's what I told. I remember telling Amanda, it's like this Bob Dylan. I don't know about this Bob Dylan. I'm not really into folk music. And then one day I'm sitting at home alone and I pop on this Free Willing Bob Dylan and uh, the girl from the North Country came on. And I was oh, listening. We're, we're back. A little, little technical Sorry. difficulty. We had to, to pause, uh, fix some camera stuff and. and there's that. We was so, talking about. Uh, you, went, you became a songwriter. Uh, bought the four thousand dollar rig. Started recording. Yeah. How did that happen? I mean. Well, I mean, once I once I got a taste of of the of the music world, and it was like, yeah, I'm all in. Like, this is definitely. I've never wanted to be like a rock star necessarily, but I've always wanted to be just a part of it. You know, just like I'm more into like all the details. You know. Anyway, so that's that's kind of that's where I got into recording. Um, 
my buddy Jeremy had this recording studio building, but uh, a lot of the gear was was. I don't, I don't I don't know if some of it wasn't functional or what, but anyways, that's when I bought this giant console, and we started recording stuff. And uh, man, so that's you what, bought it for everybody. It I bought like, it for the community, man. Right. Yeah, and in fact, uh, it while we were there, it started getting called uh, Gypsy Land, is what is what we started referring to the the, the, the house where we lived. You ever see the yeah. documentary Sound City? The board yeah, that they totally yeah the board that yeah. the Foo Fighters own now, but yeah. it was. Awesome. Does yours still exist? You know, so the one I bought, so this was this was like new technology. Um, and it was right at the cusp of uh, Pro Tools and computer recording. Like, oh, that yeah. was really starting to take off. We're talking uh, 2005, eh, 2005-ish, six. somewhere in there. So there was definitely, you know, all that was existing. But at the time, like, these consoles were still kind of, like, dependable, good technology. And uh, I wish I still had it. I don't. I sold it. On Craigslist. How big was it? Is it like as wide well, as this room? It was console? about as wide as this couch. Okay. No, so it was a twenty-four channel uh, recording console. So like a like a Derringer. Yeah, it was about thing. it was about this big. You know, it had it only had eight mic pre's, but it was twenty-four channels, and it had cool stuff. So you hook up a computer, like VGA monitor, had oh. a mouse and a keyboard, yeah. and it had a virtual patch bay, so you could take this input and move it from one to actually, I think it was maybe thirty-two channels. But um, you could you could move things around. It had uh, EQ. It had uh, really good compressors. It had plugins you could buy. A church had a big board, yeah. like like the board you find like yeah. in the back of a church, big thing yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah, Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So it was really it had motorized faders, so you could do a mix and 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 you could do your mix and record it, and then you could play it back to, for your friends or your buddies, and and the faders would sit there and move, and you could raise the, this vocal up and bring it down. So like that's just cool. It was so know. much fun, man. It was so much fun. I learned a lot on that thing for sure. And then uh, Rodney has three sons, and that's when I met his, his specifically uh, his two younger sons, uh, Jake and Mitchell. Mitchell Pyatt played with Midnight River Choir, and he, and he plays with some other guys too. He lives in New Braunfels. Uh, Mitchell's extremely talented. Yeah, Mitch, guy. yeah, yeah. And then Jake, phenomenal guitar player, and they were doing a, a thing together. And so Jake came in like, "Hey, I want to record some stuff," and I'm like, "Okay." Yeah. So we get set up and start recording. Uh, I wish I still had. I don't even think I have it anymore. But he recorded on that, that Takamine. He did an acoustic part and the vocals, and then we came back in and did the drums, and then we stacked the bass in there, and then then Jake set up. I had the Squire Stratocaster and this PV amp that I'd bought. You know, nothing fancy, but he plugged into that and just started wailing away. And I mean, it was like. This Carlos Santana meets I don't even know what it was really 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 happening. It sounded, but you know it whenever yeah you, it's one that yeah you, you hear but we rec I rec I, you know engineered the whole thing got to got to track everything and mix it and it was so much fun man. Uh, anyway so I love that so the, in these times and then like there's a song that I'd written and I'd recorded it and then Rodney shows up and he ends up like on that same guitar like putting some some real fancy stuff on top of it so I'm recording that on top of my music and. So that that was really what sparked it all that, and you know I think I don't know if we got cut off from the technical difficulties, but folk music, Bob Dylan. Um, oh yeah, the, the, you, the, the, you yeah, didn't, you wasn't you didn't really. Yeah, I told music yeah Amanda of, she brought this 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 <laughs> Bob Dylan CD home, and I'm like I don't really know if I I don't really like folk music, you know, <laughs> which is hilarious if which you know is, anything about well, me now. I love but, Bob. Yeah. We've, we've it, talked about Bob Dylan before. Yeah, well, I know more about Bob Dylan because of Wes than anybody else because of his interest in. I got deep. I went deep into it once I realized, oh, that's what folk music is. I had it in my head from that Mighty Wind movie that that's what. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if, if you don't yeah, know folk music, I, I thought that, about that's, that's I thought about people... white people singing like you know, like as a choir. I was like, no, right. You know, like, but like real folk music is like my that's my jam. You know, I like yeah. old blues, yeah. old country stuff. You know, Bob Dylan. I'm who, a huge which, Bob Dylan fan. Are you not? Yeah. Well, he's yeah, very. I, it's, I love, a, it's an acquired taste. Yeah. Um, I, I love his songwriting. I, I look. I look. I almost enjoy anybody else singing Bob Dylan, but Bob Dylan. I, I'll. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm almost second that. And yeah, and man. and I, I told that. I told you uh, what was the the song that we were just talking about? The, uh, Girl from the North Country. Girl from the North Country. He you did a cover of it yeah. sitting right here. Yeah. Um, just a little YouTube or a Facebook live thing or whatever that was. And I was like, well, this is it. This is the music that, that this is, that was mm -hmm. you at the T. I shared it. And people, I've got friends in uh, New York area oh, that, cool. that did a radio show. And 
uh, and they shared it, and it, it it got some traction because it was like well, awesome. It was better than than the Bob Dylan version, in my opinion. Oh, thank but, you, man. Thank you. Uh, I was feeling it. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna record this. It's, I don't really plan out when that happens, but I'm like, I'll be sitting around the house playing something. I'm like, oh, that I feel that. That feels good. Like I might as well and, do a video. You know, and most whatever. of my knowledge of folk music, and I said this earlier, off probably off air. It comes from following Wes on Spotify and seeing what he's listening to, <laughs> and I'll just click it and go. But you're you're usually listening to uh, uh, '80s jams and stuff like that. Yeah, I, yeah, follow I, you I too. listen to. Uh, I, I, I know all that. My Spotify list for like '80s classic yeah. rock jams. But or I've something like that. I've learned more band names and and <laughs> songs just following Wes and and then finding out. And I always follow the influences. So yeah. If, who likes who likes that band and then I'll f- find that and that's how yeah, my- yeah I, I love that and, and and realizing when he was talking about that I was like oh you're one of those people that I can because I've got a few people um we, we've got a friend Sam Sam Mal- how you say Sam's name down in Houston Sam Milan Malone Melandes Malone um anyway he's an amazing guy and he's all about punk so, yeah. so you can listen to that. But now, if I know you, I'll, I'll sorry, I just had to. Throw so, that in yeah. following you and John Napier, your buddy that you yeah. play with Lily and the Implements with, uh, y'all are my go-to for uh, music history. Uh, <laughs> and and when I said you're connecting the yeah. dots, is because how did you get into folk music? Being out here in the country, where yeah. we're you're either heavy metal or or country and western music here. And yeah. Anything else? You're so, just a long-haired hippie. Yeah. So it's you know that's that's a funny thing. I'm also I didn't realize this until uh, playing with Lily. Like that was the first real band I've ever played. I've always wanted to play in a band, but that was the first one I was just got to be a guitar player in. So much fun. I didn't realize until I just got free reign to, to do whatever I wanted on the electric guitar that how much nineties country had influenced my tone, like my sound, like, and it would, you know, because like you grew you up know, in that area. Like yeah. you think about like Steve Earle's guitar town and just those kind of low end kind of runs and stuff like that's that. And like rockabilly and blues are like huge. Like that's kind of what I go towards that. And then like this nineties so, alternative rock. See, and I just seen the sticker on this case said yeah. hardworking Americans. And, yeah. And, and I just went, you know what? That, you said some dots were being connected. I keep looking around, mm-hmm. and, and the more you talk, I go, uh, and, yeah. and, that's why. And going back yeah. to where we're sitting, there's so much uh, <laughs> little details in this room uh, <laughs> that are your influences. The books and the yeah. the the Russian, the clay Russian back here, and the uh, yeah, oh yeah, and just all all of these little details that if if you're not paying attention, it's just your daughter made that. And yeah, my daughter still made this, this little Russian steel. She made him out of clay while we were during um, during your show. We're doing a live CAC. stream at the CAC in Temple, and uh, she was watching it and she made that out of clay. <laughs> so, shout out, shout out to Russian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole family. So, yeah. so you became a songwriter um, at, from Amanda's with the four thousand uh, dollar mm-hmm. thing. When did you get on stage and start? You know, doing your thing. That's a good question. And that's funny because. The the whole the whole time I was out there, it was like boot camp for a musician, right? Like all we did was play, you know, we would go see shows. Like one weekend my buddy Jeremy was like, Hey, load up in the truck, we're going to college station. I was like, Okay, I thought we were coming back that night. I didn't pack any clothes or nothing, you know? <laughs> and uh we go and come to find out like his buddy played bass with Corey Morrow. And so we're going at the I don't remember, I don't remember the it was a big venue. It was like a hall or something i don't know anyway so yeah. we're, we're at this big venue and Corey morrow and jason bolin were playing there and so i end up doing a shot with jason bolin at the bar and like uh he's like i can't remember what the what he said but it was it was very seemed very wise at the time you know inspirational but i could see bolin so, dropping yeah. wisdom on people yeah man yeah. yeah bolin's great guy man i've 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 met him a couple of times but anyway so so this this turns into I'm gone for like three days, and we sleep in this girl's this this other girl that my buddy Jeremy knows. We like crash at her house. I end up sleeping on a tile floor with like a couch pillow, <laughs> and I didn't take my boots off. I woke up the next day with the worst athlete's foot I've ever had in my life, and so I go to this H E B and all I could find was like little ankle A and M socks. 
<laughs> and get some tenactin, you know. <laughs> Anyways, like like that, like the, all these crazy things were happening at this time, man. I uh, met some really cool people, saw some really cool shows, just kind of got like the kind of behind the scenes, like how it actually goes to be a musician and the singing, you know. And this is all in your first year. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not, I don't, so I don't, but I don't play any shows during this time. That's that, to, to yeah, get back to your question. You're, you're, you're yeah. yeah. Roll cable, I mean, I play, I play guitar and jam with people and soak up what I can, but at the time I'm just, just along for the ride, you know? And so shortly after that, like, um, I met my wife who was like my high school crush, you know, like uh, she moved, she moved to town in like the sixth grade and I was just like, oh, that's it for me, you know? And, uh, she didn't really have anything to do with me while we we're in school. Her parents and, uh, have been regretting that move ever since. <laughs> uh, no, her parents like me pretty good. I, actually, I, I remember her mom like really being like, "Yeah, you need to, you need to marry him. Like, like that's He's, who you need to be with." That you is know. Sweet. <laughs> but anyways, so I love this so thing. all it took, <laughs> all it took was for me to like quit being responsible and just go be, you know, crazy person. And she's like, "Oh, I, I, I kind of like this West guy." <laughs> So anyway, so we start dating a little, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, so we start dating, and the next thing you know, um, we we start dating, and the next thing you know, we're in, engaged, and things start moving pretty fast. And uh, because the when yeah. you was because you was talking about it being early two thousand five four five six whenever this is happening with yeah. Amanda and everything. Then you met Misty yeah. in two thousand or well, we started dating probably around two thousand six, and we got married in two thousand seven. And, and you uh, went full time, bested in the farm yeah, line. Yeah, I went back. Actually, I went back into the farm before we got married. Started making some money. He's like, okay, I kind of saw a path, you know. Like, oh, I got, yeah. I got the girl I've always loved. Like, we're gonna start a family. So how? And but anyway, so once we get married, then all of a sudden I start getting these opportunities to go. Like, I, I Kristen Kelly had a band, and she would ask me to come. I, I play at Treffs. Yeah. Which I miss Treffs, man. God. You know Derek Dutton. Yeah, man. I met Derek okay. in, in those times too, yeah. man. So I would Makes go I would go open for them and there's another band called Rusty Road that Sammy Sammy Colongo played in. Right. And they would they were pretty good to me. Like I'd open for them a bunch of times. So I'd just start playing hour sets acoustic, opening for different bands, you know. And that's kind of how the ball started rolling for me. And then over time, like uh I played my first show at O'Brien's and Temple. And you know what's funny is I've never really tried to book shows. One time I did. I made some some CDs and yeah. uh, had like some of my information, and I went around to venues trying to get gigs. So it's just but this not is a just single the one of those. That, you yeah. do. We're, now we're now we're to about 2011, 12. Yeah, yeah. That's when yeah. I met you. Yeah, I think I don't know if I was at your first show at O'Brien's, but I was. My first show at O'Brien's was was with uh, Wally West in the in the Souls. The I might have been there then. I just yeah. talked to Wally last yeah. week, by the way. Yeah, so that was Wally. I think he reached out to me. I can't remember how it he's, happened. He's playing again. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. I saw that man. Wally West. Wally West. The Lost Band yeah. Souls. He's a cool guy, man. He's from see, Chicago. Y'all know all these bands that I just I never see the names of them. That well, we were talking. Well, see about. the Temple scene and the Waco scene are so yeah. far removed, yeah. man. Are they really? It's interesting it for like, me. Like I've kind of like read in between them. I don't really believe right. it either. Temple stuff and and, seems and to, that, yeah. that's the, also the fascinating thing for me is we're a moody between Waco and Temple, yeah. so you're kind of caught in yeah. the middle. Yeah. I mean, we're talking Amanda and Rodney, which I would consider Temple. We're talking Los Roaches and yeah, and a lot of Waco and a lot of a lot of Waco names, a lot of Temple names, and you're kind of the bridge between the two. Yeah, I uh, guess so, huh? And it, and and <laughs> you name a name, and the the town comes into mind. And we're mm-hmm. what, what what is that? 35, 40 miles apart. Yeah, and the the cultures are so different. And they're they're starting to be the same now. Uh huh. But during your rise, you're the, the bridge between the two, and I, I it's just fascinating. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that that much either. Um. But it, it it's always um, been interesting to me because I, like I said, at one point I tried to actually get some steady gigs going, and that didn't really work out. I didn't push it too terribly hard, but I didn't I didn't hear back from a single packet that I dropped off at any venue, and I was like, okay, well, whatever. Well, that just kind of yeah. tells that. And that's another interesting thing about me, like even back then and even still now, like 
the, most of the stuff that I do, it's more of a singer songwriter, more of a laid back. Like I always say that sad songs make me happy. Like I'm, I like to play slower, sadder stuff typically. Really? And so like, you know, in the bar scene, like one night me and Russian were, we, me and Russian played a lot of acoustic gigs together, you know, song swapping. And one night we were playing at Aces Bar or whatever in Waco. I remember Aces. Now, now this is, this right? is like 2011. All right. And I'm talking like meth deals going on. I'm talking <laughs> shady shit. Like I can it, see it. And we're we're in, I'm not, I'm over here playing like my you know little folky stuff, you know. And they're like, play some Skinner, you know. Yeah. Like it was such a wild night that I actually was like, I think I'm done playing Waco for a while. Well, <laughs> like, I, I'm I, just think, gonna, I think the Waco like, scene, yeah. if they had it their yeah. way, everything would be kind of more rock and roll kind of shows. Yeah, a yeah. lot more. Of I respect it. that. Yeah. I, I, I was like, I don't think I really fit in here. You yeah, know? And I, don't, I don't know that Waco in itself has fully accepted that. Well, I think in 2010, 11, Waco was more, I, I don't want to say a biker town, mm -hmm. but, but, but that blue collar, yeah. gritty, gritty um, consumer of music i yeah. mean those people want to hear their their skinner is what yeah. you just said yeah. i think in belton it's, it's more way. of the little bars around and yeah uh, well it's changed and, too and like chef started up around yeah. then and started bringing in the country so i think around the 2010 waco's still trying to find their venues and chefs is and our belton and temple with o'brien's and is bringing in the country acts. Well, y'all, because y'all already kind of had them. That they were somewhat established. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, definitely. And there, it, there was but, uh, there was places in Waco, but it was a lot of bars. And there was yeah. cinema. I understand cinema did did a few. Things. I remember then, cinema. Yeah, uh, Wild West. You know the guys that don't. There was what was it C and R bar that was a thing for a while. Now this is this is like 2010, sure. 2011. And it's more the but, the clientele yeah. that is going out to see the live music. I think Waco's the, the Waco's uh, end user and Temple yeah. Belton's. And Colleen has its own culture. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, metal, punk, rap. Totally, yeah. More yeah. metal and Colleen, yeah. more More rap and more and, metal, I think. Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's but I did, I, I, learned, I learned this about like what I do. Uh, I'd be playing, I'd be playing these gigs and, and like nobody's listening, you know, I didn't feel like anybody cared. And uh, I just and that's keep, the way a lot of it I just is. keep doing my thing though, but I, I would just always notice towards the end of the night, people were like, wait, 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 you're stopping? No. Like I have this way of creating a vibe and creating like a, this really chill, like comfortable thing. And people are happy to like have a good time and talk and have a good time while it's happening. And it, sometimes when I'm feeling like extra nervous about it, like I take it personal, but no, like I've come to realize now that that just means they're having a good time. And, um, but there's a fine line yeah. with that, though. Yeah. There, there, I think there are artists who are who are really good at, at, at just going up, and they can have a handful of their own songs, mm -hmm. and they do really good at throwing, you know, a, a lot of covers in there, and and to get and the crowds yeah. aren't always engaged. Your background music, yeah. And there's a fine line, I think, between being an artist that can just go play some stuff where you're just background music, mm -hmm. and then play in a sitting room, yeah. Where people are there to hear you. Well, that's play. that's and a uh, big difference. Yeah, but I'm that that's my dream is like to play the, listening the city rooms. Room. I, I love people. That, that's There's nothing the, better when you're playing. That's why the CAC yeah. is it, yeah. you at the CAC is just great. Yeah. So like, kind of keep going forward on me playing gigs. Like when Barrow Brewing opened in Salado, uh, some of my buddies were working there, and. Barrow's Barrow Brewing, not to stop you, but Barrow Brewing's done a lot for for oh, the, totally. the area in Salado totally. Temple, yeah. right? I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Katie and Graydon. Everybody's always talking yeah. about. Katie that. and Graydon, the owners, man, they're just great people, and they're super. They've 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 done a lot for local musicians and just artists. Supporting, them. yeah, yeah, and but it's never the same musicians. It's no, always a good yeah, variety. No, exactly. The best thing about Salado, though, like the first few times I played there. I'd be playing in this room. There may only be like 15, 20 people listening, but yeah. every single one of them are like, they're giving me energy. They're like really invested in it. Wow. And, and that, that was, that was a turning point for me. That was like what really inspired me to keep playing. Let's take a quick break right there. Okay. Uh, we'll yeah. Cause I interrupted him and, and everything. And that, I don't want to forget <laughs> where I interrupted him at. I didn't forgot already. So I didn't want to interrupt we'll talk, you, but I did. We'll yeah. talk about your next stage. Okay. Uh, going from singer songwriter. Okay. Uh, so we'll be we'll take a quick break, reset the cameras, we'll be right, right back. back. Okay. This is Steve with Lily Milford. Hello, Hello Texas. Texas. 
Woo! We're back. Hello, Texas. Why? Why? We're back. Tim flirts with his wife right here. What's up, girl? <laughs> so we're here uh, at uh, West Perryman's house in the our my favorite venue for podcasts so far. This is the the night. This is the calmest. Yeah, it's one. We've yeah, done, we we usually are screaming over TVs uh, behind us at yeah. a backyard. I like that. Today's Super Bowl Sunday when we were taping. Um, so we figured we didn't want to do it with a bunch of drunk people getting ready for the Super Bowl. You just do it with uh, one drunk person that's not getting ready for the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's drunk? Uh, that's more of just broad. Has been oh, just a broad oh, statement. Oh, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I so, just noticed the picture up there. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. So. I completely missed that. Um, so we, when we left, we were talking about Barrel Brewing, how great of a place it is, how diverse the music is that they they put on there. Definitely. Um, I mean, you you don't just go to see country acts or folk acts or hard rock acts. I mean, you don't you never know what's yeah. playing there, which 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 is really fitting for Salado, I think. Yeah. Um, the beautiful thing, I mean, you couldn't have Barrel without Salado. So the locals are, um, man, they changed my life. They really just gave me a breath of fresh air and some confidence to keep playing because they really appreciate it. You know, I was talking earlier about, you know, playing and just kind of being background music. And I was really freaking good at it. I mean, people would, you know, I was playing a elected officials party. Uh, mm. It, um, what is it? It's, it's, it's a big... Um, resort lost pines resort which is out yeah. uh anyway so i i got hired and they're like what do you charge I was like i want a room and five hundred dollars and they're like okay <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <six>. so, <laughs> yeah so so anyway so i'm playing the selected officials and they're like one thing is you can't have a tip jar because we're you know for blah 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 i don't know what legal purposes but mm. anyways so i was like okay that's fine and so i'm playing and and uh early on i'm playing and i'm like are these people even liking it you know um and uh, everybody's drinking. And by the end of the night, I got people like, I'll give you $100. Come back and play at our room. You know, there's all this, like, <laughs> like don't stop playing, you know. We, and uh, so I've had plenty of nights like that, you know, just random, just yeah. getting to know people and just the psychology behind being a musician, you know. And and uh, it, it's it's a it's a really strange trip doing, you know, what, well, what, I, I, what I do, you know. There's, there's something, especially whenever you're in, in an environment like that, there's something intriguing about the musician because you're this mysterious guy behind the mic. Totally. There's this whole, that yeah. whole thing. Totally. Well, your story is in, in your songs, in your yeah. original stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I can hear that. but And then your influences, this, the, not your original yeah. stuff. You can hear your influences. Well, I realized a long time ago, you know, like I could make a lot more money singing, you know, uh, Folsom Prison and... You know, and actually, I freaking played Wagon Wheel <laughs> before any mother ever played Wagon Back Wheel. Back when it was a like, uh, <laughs> I had a I had a satellite radio, and I you know I spent hours at a time in a tractor, you know, yeah. and then so I get tired of local, so I bought this little XM radio thing, you know, you put the, res, the little antenna out, yep. and anyway, so I was listening to X Country. And that's where I heard I it. Loved X that's Country. like one of the first places I heard like John Prine, Mojo Nixon. That's where I first heard uh, Wagon Wheel. Yeah. And I was like, what is this? So I'm playing Wagon Wheel. I, I can remember playing Wagon Wheel. Like, I'm talking years before that turned into what it did, you know? Yeah, don't so, play that. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah. when they got rid of... I, I did a really good <laughs> version of When they got rid of Cross Country or X Country on... Yeah. Uh, it wasn't serious. It was XM Radio. Yeah. I, I, I got rid of yeah. my XM Radio. There was no reason for yeah. me to listen to it. I anymore. heard of the Avid Brothers. Like, I got into them, like, yeah. way before they blew up. So that was interesting. Mm. We went and saw them at the La Zona Rosa in Austin, and Will Hogue opened for them. And Will Hogue, it was before oh. Will Hogue was anything. Will Hogue was the opening act. I'm, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. Uh, I think because of you, I learned who Tessie Lou was. Was, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tessie Lou and the Shotgun Stars. Yeah. Did we just do yeah. her? Uh, so she was on a fresh, cut. fresh Cuts two weeks ago. Awesome. So uh, you know who her dad Tessie is, Lou, right? Uh, he does bass for um, Kenny's, who played on my record. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So 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 it, there's there's a lot, lot of cross paths. Yeah. Um, and he had the really cool old stand up. Yeah. I think it was there. a 1901 model stand up yeah. bass, and I didn't realize yeah. it until after he left who he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think y'all told me, and I was just too overwhelmed with the whole thing. But. I bummed a cigarette off him during the, the studio session, 
and he was smoking Camel non filters. Yeah, and and me and me and Evan Shepard, we we both were like, oh, that's a good cigarette. <laughs> so we proceeded to smoke like three packs of Camel non filters while I'm like cutting my record and singing like <laughs> genius, but, you know. But we had Tessie but, Lou on Fresh Cut, so I'm looking for music uh, for next week, mm-hmm. and I got connected to a girl named Hannah King, which was the first song that I put on this week. Hannah King is from Montana, which Tessie Lou's from Montana. Ah. She's got like 30 listeners on uh, on uh, Spotify. Mm-hmm. Nobody's heard right. her music. I mean, doesn't have a following. But it sounds like Nickel Creek. It sounds like uh, uh, Allison Krauss. Oh, she's cool. A, she's a champion fiddle wow. player. And so oh, I like yeah. I that liked it so song. much. Mm-hmm. I liked it so much. I contacted her on That's Facebook awesome. and said, yeah. here's why I found you. I'm... I'm going to put you on, uh, even though I'm doing like Texas music, yeah. I don't care. It's That's cool, good. man. But uh, and there was a reason I was telling you the story, but just all of the interconnections that, yeah, it, it's just all. So, so that was kind of the, the whole dream about building this, this place out here. And I actually have a bigger dream to it. I don't know if we'll get around to it, but I just love the, the thought of community and supporting. And, and I, I've gotten some of that. There's been a handful of musicians that are traveling through that'll come stay here. There's a guy named Sean Devine that's from Montana. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, he's, 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 he, he'll, he'll book a run. So he'll, he'll travel in his van and he'll go from, from Montana all the way. His final gig is usually um, at Galveston at, um, yeah, my brain. Um, old quarter, the old quarter. Yeah. yeah, I can't believe I forgot that. But anyways, okay, I pulled so, that out of my ass. so Sean will ah. Sean will book a couple of dates. Like we'll we'll play like we we've, we've played Slow Rise and Waco. We have played O'Brien's a couple of times. Yeah, so he'll come crash here. But I love having musicians come through, camp out. We you know yeah. pick and play, and I just love that whole community. You know, so that that's been a a big part of like that for me. Like fills me up more than you know than more than just playing yeah i I, I just i love that whole that whole community you know but um i got i met john napier (laughs) napier um i heard the first time i heard him he was doing like this um uh like a gospel record with a a guy named nate rodriguez i don't know if you've heard of nate but he's nate's phenomenal man like i met him when he was living in waco and nate would have me come up and play acoustic so i knew about nate through uh galley winner yeah uh, brad behealer okay coming down to uh uh, used to be green fest now it's called river jam yeah but uh Nate would come yeah. down and play church on Sunday yeah. on the back porch oh, of uh, yeah. Lone Star yeah. Float House with us. And then I called him at Lafayette and a few other places around. I used to, I used that to play. That guy's incredible. I used to. Nate Rod, yeah. Nate Rod. I used to play three-hour sets with him at the doghouse on uh, Waco really? Drive. The doghouse. Holy crap. And, and, and uh, we did a podcast yeah. with John, and he talked a lot about it in yeah. episode one. So yeah. so uh, the first time I heard of John, I'll try to keep this condensed. Sorry. But, uh, we, could, we could do that, a whole yeah. hour on you and John. So he was, doing, he was doing these gospel songs, and Nate's playing drums, and this other guy's playing like organ, and it's like the coolest freaking thing I've ever heard. Like he's doing like I'll Fly Away, and it just – like to this day, like it's phenomenal. Anyway, so I'd heard of him that way, and then uh, my buddy Russian Steele, who's the lead singer of Hog Leg Ellis, phenomenal songwriter, he's going to play at Pootie's Roadhouse in Spicewood, and uh, yep. John was hosting the songwriter night there, and so Russian invited me to tag along, right? And I'm like, yeah, it was like a legend to me already, like you know, this John sure, Napier guy. I'll go. So, so like, hell yeah. So I load up. I ended up like song swapping, like the three of us. And me and John just hit it off from day one. Like we both had a love for things like Ry Cooter, who's a phenomenal guitar player and songwriter. And uh, we just kind of, next thing you know, John's having me back out there to play a Sunday night with him at Pooties. And then yeah. I started having John come up here and play at Barrow at Salado. And we play, you know, different little Miller's uh, Barbecue in Belton for a while. They were doing big. Yeah, that's right. They they were really supportive for a while. I think they got so popular selling barbecue. It was like, why, why are we, we don't even need to be open in the evening. Johnny, Johnny Reynolds were, was booking yeah, the bands there. Yeah, now he's cooking yeah. barbecue. He doesn't care about yeah. the bands. But uh, but yeah, so so me and John, we just kind of buddy buddy. And then so we, when he'd come up and play here, he'd always crash at the farm. And uh, one thing led to another, and you know he was in a position. I was like, hey, just come come live at the farm. So he, I don't know, he lived here for a couple of years and. You know, it's funny. We listened to so much music, had so much good times, and that's kind of what led to Lily and the Implements. But uh, it's it's amazing. We only wrote a handful of songs together, you know. So, so, so tell me, 
sorry. You yeah. go. I'm, I'm interested in, in how you come about, because you made friends with John. Mm-hmm. Who knew Lily? You were John. So me and Lily knew of each other through the temple scene right? over, over the years. Now, okay. L- Lily Melford, yeah. uh, I met her 2011 or 12, about the same time I, yeah. I saw you playing at O'Brien's. Uh-huh. She was fronting a band, uh, two female lead singers, Megan Day and uh, Lily. The band was Hangar 24. Yeah. Uh, and they did a lot of heart covers and it just you know rock songs and lily and megan together i've never seen a band with two female leads and both of them could just nail it that's cool and uh so i was a groupie for hangar 24 Mm -hmm. before they went their separate ways and uh then lily did the singer songwriter uh she played open at chefs a couple times uh me and bobby mcgee is what i tell people Lily's got a Janis Joplin sound. Yeah. Which doesn't sound like Janis Joplin. Um, yeah. That's hard to explain to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. You got to hear it. You, you, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. Oh, Lily. yeah. So that brings us to yeah. Lily and the Implements. So, so me and John were hanging out here doing a lot of crazy things, playing music, playing a lot of gigs. And one night we were playing at Barrow, and uh, this long haired kid was like hanging out, just like really liking it all. And that was Evan Shepard. And so we met Evan that night, and he was like, yeah, man, I'm a drummer, and, you know, I play in another band, but I'd love to come jam with you all. And we're like, yeah, man. So and we Evan, had already had this plans. This was Evan talking Evan, about Evan, jam with you and, and John. Me and John, yeah. Okay. Evan, yeah. I met Evan just before that playing with the Lucas Woolley Band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and we became friends, uh, and he had the deer in the headlights look back then. Yeah. And not until he started playing with y'all that I'm like, oh, well, there you are. There's Evan Shepard. And <laughs> yeah. now he's yeah. like oh, he's drummer extraordinary. So, oh, he's, he's, he's awesome. He's a phenomenal drummer. So, and that's another funny thing, like another little side note. I don't know how many years I've been, if I could just find a good drummer. Like drummers are so hard to come by that aren't just like, Evan's a loud drummer too. And me and John worked really hard to kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know, show him. Uh, they're uh, not you don't, really. You don't I'm, have to own the room. Love man. you, Evan, but I'm I'm just being He's funny. He's the baby but, of the band. But no, he he grew a lot. He grew a lot, and and it was fun watching him like just learn dynamics and not just but always, it, you know, not always just how hard can I hit it? Exactly. Yeah. 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 But, but it's, it's so just having someone that wants to yeah. grow is a big. But yeah, we, so we had this plan as the three of us to do something, uh, probably more just like focusing back and forth between my songs and John's songs. This little trio. And um, which, so yeah, which, which so John I Napier's finally, accomplished in his yeah. own right. Evan's an up and comer, and then yeah. you have your own stuff. So the three of y'all so, could go off on your own. All three yeah. of you could do your own thing. Yeah, and so Evan showed up. I'm like, finally, like a, a cool drummer, like wants to like. Is in, I was so so elated, you know. I was like, this is awesome. So we we get together and jam one weekend, and it was great. And then all of a sudden, I get this message from Lily saying, "Hey, I've got this gig coming up at the Swan Dive in Austin. I need to put a band together. Are you down?" I was like, "Yeah. In fact, I just met a drummer." And, and she's like, what about a bass player? I was like, I don't know. And John instantly was like, I'm not playing bass. <laughs> and oh, really? so, yeah, yeah. He's like, it, because it, I don't know how many bands you know where there's an actual bass player. Usually it's a guitar player that gets stuck playing bass, you know? Uh, and that's, sorry, you know, not sorry. That's just, I know. That's, I think that's, how that's just the truth. That's just how it goes, you know? So Lily shows up. Me and her and Evan are going through her stuff, sitting right here. And John's just hanging out listening. And... uh we, get, we play through a few songs. He's like, damn it, I'll play bass. <laughs> it's like, it's so good. You know, he, he, know it, he knew it was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he was feeling it. Would you call John yeah. kind of like the old man in, in the group? Totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he's the, and, yeah. and I don't mean old man in the sense of age, but well, just in season. Yeah, he's discerning too. He ran sound at Pooties for like seven years. So yeah, every freaking night, he's got working bands coming through. So he's like, heard it all. Like he's aware of what, you know, like, and, and he's just a very discerning taste as far as, he has a, he has a phenomenal record collection. So me and him, we would well, sit here night after night and just, just, just basically playing battle of who can play the better music, you know, and uh, tons of fun, tons so, of fun. So your first show uh, was in Austin. The Swan Dive, yeah. Uh, this was two years ago? Yeah. yeah, it was January of 2019. And then right after that, I think your second show was at Barrow. I think so. And yeah. that's when I'll say my yeah. life changed. I yeah. got to see... What I consider an, all, an all-star band. We played we played eight hours here one day, one Sunday, practicing, 
basically that whole day was devoted to getting if i go away down like we we worked that whole freaking song out i mean we played other songs that day but like we just kept coming back to that but i'm talking like legit eight hours of playing music in this room and uh it was just so much fun like i still have recordings on my phone and it's interesting to listen to those and kind of watch videos along the way on you on right. facebook of like playing gigs and Progression just watching watching the songs progress and to watch them become. grow yeah i, I, I yeah. Like say i like to say they mature or yeah. grow up i love i'm i'm so grateful to be friends with with a couple of musicians to the point to where they'll have a rough cut and they'll send it to me and go, listen, this is a really rough cut. Y'all always do that. Yeah. And I, I, I will say no, but no musicians ever. Yeah. They don't want hey, to put it down permanently. I just, I just want you to know this is a really rough cut. Yeah. I'll get these these texts and go, hey, dude, just give this a listen. And you get a song right then. Mm-hmm. And you know it was just born. Yeah. And then you watch that grow song, that song grow up. You know, Mason Hayes just done one. And I watched it go through every level when, and he laid down the tracks and stuff. Okay, this is this. Is, mm-hmm. and, until it became a release. And and it was pretty close to the same, but I've also seen them not even be the same song. Yeah. Well, that's you the know? fun thing and, about Lily is right. when she when she approached us with these songs, she just stuff she'd, she'd been playing acoustic. There was no like there's one song that she's like, I think it sounds so too y'all got to develop it. Ooh, completely. Yeah. It was so much fun. And, and it was the, so the, much that first fun. Barrow show. Oh. I saw the, yeah. I saw y'all early yeah. and it's the, it's even evolved. since. So that first if you show. listen to our stuff, like there was one song, let me know, which is one of my favorites. So you were saying yeah. earlier, it's one, um, she was like, I think it just sounds too much like a Chris Isaac song. You know, that song, uh, wicked game. Like, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't want to fall in love, you know? Yeah. And cause of the chord progression is similar, you know, but you know music like how many songs are, yeah exactly so anyway so so like i'm just sitting there thinking like well how how can i make this sound the furthest thing from a chris isaac song and so that's where i came up with the which is like kind of the hook to that song you know had you played electric guitar before the band you know yes but not really i've never really i've always been, been a, an, i've always been an acoustic player you know cuz i think you had, and, you had made mention earlier so let, let me back up a little bit. I want to say this. You said earlier, being with Lily was the first time you've just been the guitar player. Yeah, man. It's so but this whole so freeing. thing puts y'all together. Mm-hmm. You can play a guitar, but this is like the first time. It's the first time I'm branching out, like trying to be like. Not just being a guitar player. It, was, not, it scared me to that, death, too. Playing, yeah, like I, being I, I, the lead guitar player. Like, oh, man, okay. I remember, I remember that conversation. Play at, at, um, what is it down in Austin? Me, we went down there. Yeah, y'all uh, came down for. Uh, oh, y'all came down to Saxon. Yeah. Saxon, yeah. yeah. Saxon's yeah. Pro- you weld. Thanks, so, man. So I'm just realizing now. That was a whole new world for me, man. And I, and you know, I mentioned earlier, like I can't read music. I've also never been a lead guitar player, like learning right. lead parts. So I'm playing completely from the gut and just completely just from feel. Really? Yeah. That whole. I, I I don't have nothing. I'm sorry. I, I could, if I wish I could. Normally, I'm not. No, I just, it's just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, that y'all just dove in. Y'all yeah. just it, and it went from zero. It was a to, purely organic thing. Man. Yeah, and it was zero to good. sixty. It was, thanks, man. It, it was really good. Yeah, that's, that's the part about it. It's re- everybody can't do that, and it just fall into and, place. And and all four of you, I would consider different type of artist. Yeah. Um, and it all just comes together. So it does, man. I miss it. That's what with COVID yeah. happening. Last year, about a year ago, we were set up to play. We had this big uh, music festival that a company out of Austin was putting together with a couple of bigger name bands out of Austin, uh, Bright Light Social Hour and White Denim. And and they had us paired with them. We were basically opening for them. But I was super stoked on that. I just bought a bunch of merch, like T-shirts for the band. And uh, and then COVID happened. It's just like... Everything just kind of. We were supposed to play St. Patrick's Day at O'Brien's. That got. That was the first one that got canceled. Yeah. Like we we just got our merch in. We were like so excited, and then like you know that went away, and then so I'm definitely nostalgic. And also miss. I miss playing shows, man. I miss going out there and doing it. it it's but, such a good thing. But through COVID, y'all recorded. We actually recorded before COVID. That's right. Sadly, 2019. Oh you know, man, that's... I don't know why we haven't put that out already. Right. Yeah, so there's there's an album. Out. Yeah. There's an album that's not released yeah. yet, but probably good that it's not released because you can't tour on it and right and push it. Yeah. Um, and but, then go ahead. No, go ahead. 
And then you recorded. Uh, let's let's talk about your recording of the album. Yeah. Uh, Can we, let's let's do this. Let's take a break, and mm-hmm. I want to come back and let's talk. And yeah. I beat this thing. Yeah. Is that all that coming through? Yeah. Yeah. Stop it. Yeah, I, I'm with I'm with hers. Let's, let's quit touching it. Let's let's take a break and let's come back. <laughs> y'all, y'all stop being mean to me. I didn't yeah. mean to hit it, and then yes, I kept did. hitting it. I did right. that on purpose. We'll come back. We'll talk about talk recording. About yeah. Yeah. But both albums. Oh, there's there's more than one. Mm. So the, the little teaser. We'll be mm. back. Okay. See you, Texas. <laughs>